Well, so we're not talking about moire patterns, despite the fact that I've worn, you know, the worst shirt ever. Um, yeah, so I'm afraid you're just gonna have to put up with that. This interesting paper came out a couple of weeks ago, which was doing some rounds on social media because it's just quite an interesting concept. And the concept is basically extracting secret keys from smart cards and other devices by just looking at the flickering of LEDs on their power circuits. So in essence, you look at the LED, it flickers on and off a little bit as, as the power consumption changes and you can read off the secret key, which is just ridiculous as a concept, right? But actually kind of makes sense when you break, it, break down how it works. It does sound a bit far-fetched, which is what's so cool about it. In actual fact, side channel attacks like this, power analysis and things, are actually, have actually been quite common in the past. And so maybe we talk mostly about that and just in general how they work uh, and before we talk a bit about the LED uh, thing. I suppose the take home message really is, apart from it's really interesting, is this is a lot harder to stop than you think, right? If you don't think about this when you implement your cryptographic algorithm, you could have your LEDs giving away all your secrets. Okay, so we're gonna put this aside for a moment and just think about power analysis. We actually did a video on the square multiply algorithm, if you recall, a little while ago, which if I do say so myself, is a great video and you should definitely, definitely watch it. But actually, what something I mentioned in that video very briefly was the idea that if you're not careful with your implementations of algorithms like this, they can be vulnerable to something called power analysis or the idea that you can look at how much power this is consuming on the CPU or from the power supply and start to, to actually read off secret bits of key, right? Which doesn't seem very likely at all, but actually if you're bad of your implementation is quite straightforward. So if we look very briefly back at how that worked, when you do an RSA digital signature, one of the operations you do is you take some form of your message, let's call it M or M prime or something, which is maybe like a hash of, of your message or a padding of your message, and you're gonna raise this number to the power of your private key, right? mod some giant number N. Now, if you remember when we talked about binary exponentiation or a square and multiply algorithm, what you would actually do is you would represent this D here as binary, and then you would do a series of square or multiply operations to calculate that sum really, really quickly, because otherwise you could never do it in time. So for example, if your current value was x to the 101, and that's in binary, and you needed to get to 1010, you could square this number, right? So that would be x to the 101 times by x to the 101 is equal to x to the 1010, right? Very straightforward. And if you wanted to increase it by one, you could do x to the 1010 times by x is equal to x to the 1011. Right? Now, that's the whole algorithm, as per the video. You just do a series of these and you can converge on whatever this private key is. So what do we do with this as an attacker? Well, that means that suppose your, your secret key is 101101011. Now in practice, it would be quite a lot longer than this. And suppose you're in the middle of this algorithm. If you see a zero, you're going to need to do a square. If you see a one, you need to first produce the zero, then produce the one. So you need to do a square followed by a multiply, which is essentially two operations. So sometimes you use one operation and sometimes you use two operations. And which of those you do will depend on if you've got a zero or a one in your private key. That's a dangerous place to be, right? Because if you, suppose you, put some kind of sensor device on the power supply or you were looking at the LED and it was reflecting the amount of power consumption but let's say the CPU or the cryptographic chip or whatever it was in this system was doing you might see something like this so maybe this is your graph of power now this is power and this is time and you see it kind of do this and it's using up some power and suddenly it just sort of spikes up like this and then comes back down right and then maybe it spikes up again and comes back down and then it spikes up again and it comes back down Right? And what you realize is that that is a multiply and that is a square and a multiply together because it takes longer. Right? And, and you think, well, that's actually a bit simple now to read off the bits because that's one, zero, one, one. You know, and even I could write that code. And it's surprisingly difficult to stop these things and you have to give it real thought. Right? So what I mentioned in the previous video was what you might do is you might do something like the square always multiply algorithm or some variant of this where you're always doing a square and a multiply even if it's a zero and that way this happens in constant time and you don't have this issue where it goes quicker or slower or takes more or less power depending on the bits of the key. There are loads of variants of this including two variants that are in this paper. 
right? So the, one of the ones in the paper is how long the signature process takes for an elliptic curve DSA signature can divulge with enough of these what the secret key is. Right. Um, because basically it informs us on how many leading zeros there are in the random number that was used during the signature. Right. Now, we're not going to delve all into that, into that uh, attack, but you can get the idea that if you could measure the power or the time that things take, it could give you some clues as to what the secret keys might be. That in itself is super, super interesting. Now, what this paper has done, which is perhaps even more interesting, is they've managed to do away with the fact that I've had to sneak in and stick something on the power cable to work out what's going on here. Right? That's a perfectly reasonable attack. If I say I can break your secret key, but to do it, I have to get into the server room and plug something in, that's still a huge problem because that could happen. I put on the high-vis jacket and I say I, I've, I've got to wave some ID. You have a ladder under your arm. Have a ladder. It makes it look like I'm, I'm fixing the air conditioning or something and, and actually I've got my little, little device. Um, it, you, you wouldn't be able to argue that that was cryptographically secure. Right? But if you can do this remotely over a camera on the internet, that would be, I would argue, even less secure. Uh, so, so that's where this paper come, is, is, is coming from. So what they've noted is that the circuitry that controls the power LED on some of these devices is essentially the same battery and same circuitry that's used to do the computation. Right? They're all on the same kind of circuit. And that means that as the power consumption of the CPU changes, the power going through the LED also changes. And that has very, very slight but notable differences in the intensity of these LEDs over time. So you might imagine a situation just like how I was reading off the power of a, of a device by putting some specialist, specialist hardware on it, I just look at an LED and it, gets, it goes like bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim, like this, and I can start reading off bits or interpreting that in some way, depending on the algorithm being used. That's a huge problem. Um, now, one of the issues with this is that, you know, these are not slow algorithms. Right? CPUs are very fast, even on smart card readers and smart cards. And that means that the changes in the LED are gonna be both very, very slight but also really rapid, right, in the order of, of you know, nanoseconds, milliseconds kind of, a, kind of time scale. And we don't have cameras, or at least I can't afford a camera that runs at that kind of frame rate. So what they did in this particular paper was they used the rolling shutter effect on a camera to massively increase the frame rate because all they care about is the general intensity of the LED, not exactly where it is. So imagine a situation where You've zoomed your camera right into an LED, right? either because you've got a camera with a zoom attached to it, or you've held your phone really close. Right? Now, it might be a bit obvious what you're doing, but you know, let's, let's, let's just go with it. So your field of view of your picture has this little giant whacking LED right in the middle of it like this. Right? Now, this LED is going up and down as cryptographic operations are happening. And of course, it doesn't matter if it's in focus. Oh, we'll come to that. It doesn't, no, it doesn't matter if it's in focus. If anything, it's probably slightly better if it's not in focus, because it averages things out nicely. Now, we won't worry about the edge, but maybe you zoom in a bit further and you get everything in. Now, this camera, let's say on your iPhone or your, your IP-based camera that you've managed to hack into, right? maybe that's operating at about 60 frames a second or something like this. That is nowhere near fast enough to capture the kind of imperceptible changes that are happening to this LED. But the camera isn't actually capturing an image every 60th of a second, right? There are lots of really cool videos, including by Smarter Every Day, Stand Up Maths, on rolling shutter effects and the weird things that happens to propellers and stuff like this, exactly the same process. Essentially what happens is the camera scans down the rows, capturing bits of image as we go, right? Because that's the easiest way to offload them. So we capture the first row and then the next row and then the next row and then the next row. And so across a row, that might happen quite rapidly and between rows, we might see this is now, this LED got slightly dimmer when we got to this row and then slightly brighter again when we got to this row. And we might find that basically if you've got a, a let's say a 4K camera, you're going to increase the frame rate of your, of your system by about a thousand times. Well, that's even HD is a thousand. Yeah, even HD. So, you know, and yes, you, there's going to be some noise in this system and there's a, there's, a, there's a slight delay between when you finish the first, one frame and you start the next frame. So there are lots of things you have to calibrate for, but it is practical. You point your camera at an LED and you just video it. And then the fact that these are ever so slightly different is all you need to be able to start to do the same kind of power analysis we were just showing on the graph. Right? And you haven't had to install any specialist hardware. You might have still had to put on a, on a hat and pretend you, you weren't there, but you know. Um, so 
What this attack did was they used both, they used both a, an iPhone and also a standard IP camera that they could control and they zoomed right in on two different LEDs. One of them was, was getting ever so slightly less bright and bearing in mind that these are RGB cameras so they're producing red, green and blue values between 0 and 255. You might see the average between these changing by one or two pixel values, right? Not a lot, but enough that you can see it. You know. There's another kind of smart card reader that's LED changes between blue and red depending on what it's up to. And so you can start to work out how long it's been processing for depending on what colors some of these LEDs are, right? And so they're similar attacks, different algorithms, different, different cryptographic protocols are attacking, same kind of principle. So I find this really, really interesting because you, know, you think there's no way, I've, I've made my smart card reader, I've, I've used special algorithms or whatever, no one's, no one's getting into this, it's tamper-proof, all this kind of business, and you realize that your LED is just divul divulging your, uh, your secret key, and that's not what you want. So in the paper, they attack two different algorithms. One is elliptic curve DSA, which is used for digital signatures, very common in digital certificates. Um, another is uh, SIKE, or super singular um, isogeny elliptic curve key exchange or something, I don't know, something like that, right? Which has its own problems actually as an algorithm anyway, but it's one of these quantum resistant algorithms, or at least it, it was until recently. Uh, so um, two different algorithms, basically same kind of problem. It's, it doesn't, in a way, I think it's quite interesting how common these kind of problems are across implementations, across different algorithms. When you're doing computation based on a secret, you better be sure that that computation is extremely consistent because otherwise, you're going to divulge what that secret is, which is you know really really interesting. That is a bad shirt for filming, but I'm not. Is it, is it going to be a problem? I'm not going to make you take it off. Is no, it going to be a no, problem? No, but look at the Moira. Can you see on there? I know. Do you think we can? I, I thought about it, and I thought maybe no, we don't. don't can worry we about sort it. it out like by zooming in or something? Or it all comes down to what we can how, make a joke how it about looks it on whatever resolution it ends up as yeah, and whatever. Yeah, yeah. So there's not a lot we can do there.